How is everybody? Did you have a good break? Ready for uh, the final stretch? <laughs> okay, let's uh, do some more approximation algorithms. Um, so just let's recap what uh, an approximation algorithm is for a hard problem, right? It doesn't have to be a, a, a and p-hard problem, it could even be a, a polynomial time solvable problem. For example, um, if you want to compute a max, a, a large matching in a graph, right? We know that we can compute a maximum matching in a bipartite graph via reduction to flow, right? Uh, uh, but non-bipartite non, uh, graphs we didn't do, but it's a more complicated algorithm. You can solve maximum matching even in a non bipartite graph in polynomial time, but it's a more complicated algorithm, right? And even flow, if, if you, if you, um, flow is, uh, you know, is not reasonably fast, but it can, it can take uh, to solve max, I mean, bipartite matching, it takes m square root n time, if you do it a little bit cleverly. You may find that's too slow, right? Maybe you want to have a very fast matching for whatever reason you're doing, right? So one thing you could do is, you know, you can find a maximal matching, right? You know, take an edge, keep on taking edges as long as they don't intersect with the previous edges, right? So it's a maximal matching. That's very fast, right? You can implement a maximal matching in linear time, right? You take an edge, arbitrary edge, remove both endpoints, take another edge, keep on doing it, you can do it in linear time. Right? That's very fast. Now, is it any good, right? You can ask, is it any good? And you can prove very easily, and you know, it's a good exercise for you guys, is you can prove that a maximal matching is at least half the times of maximum matching. Okay, maybe that's not very good, but at least you'll get an estimate very quickly, right? Does a graph have a large matching or doesn't it have a large matching, right? If you want to do a quick back of the envelope calculation, you can do it in linear time, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, well, you know, what is the formal definition of approximation algorithm for an optimization problem? It's an algorithm which we want to make sure runs in polynomial time, right? So it's an efficient algorithm in the sense that it runs in polynomial time. And it will give a solution, always a valid solution. If it doesn't give a valid solution, then we're not talking about approximation because it's not even giving a solution. So it's supposed to give a valid solution, but the value of the solution could be suboptimal. That means it's not going to be the best value solution there is. So then we quantify the how suboptimal it is by saying, ah, if it's an alpha approximation, if, for example, if I'm doing a minimization problem, its cost is no more than alpha times the optimum value for every instance, right? You know, it has to make sure that for every instance it returns a solution which is no more than alpha times the optimum uh, solution value. It gives a solution whose value is no more than alpha times, uh, right? For example, a two approximation means that it will give a solution which is no more than two times the cost of the best solution. Uh, for what about maximization, right? Uh, you know, because it's a hard problem, alpha is going to be greater than or equal to 1, right? If you're minimizing, optimum algorithm would get alpha equal to 1. If it's an approximation, alpha is going to be maybe bigger than 1, right? 2, 3, 5, 10, or whatever, right? What about uh, maximization problem? For maximization, we are going to give a solution whose value is going to be less than the optimum value, right? It, it won't be equal to the optimum, it's going to be less. So there are two notational things uh, that people use, so it can be confusing sometimes. So what does it mean that I give you a half approximation for a maximization problem? It means that I'm going to give you a solution which is at least half the value of the optimum solution, right? That makes sense, right? I am, because I'm maximizing, I'm going to give you something which is less than one. The ratio is less than one. That means my solution is half as good as the best one. One third as good as the best one, right? But People sometimes don't use that notation. They'll say, even for maximization, I get a two approximation. What does it mean to get a two approximation for a maximization problem? I can't get two times the optimum value, right? So they're simply saying, you know, instead of telling, saying it's half, I'm going to flip it and say it is two. Okay, that's just a notational convenience, right? So that, okay, so that's that's not uh, okay. So people use both uh, both uh, notations, and sometimes it's uh, confusing. But uh, from the context, you can usually tell. Okay, so we're going to do two, two problems today to illustrate simple techniques and, and uh, 
get some idea of how people do approximation. It's a little different style of thinking than just exact algorithms. So, yeah, mind has to switch a little bit, okay? Because we will, let's do a couple of examples, right? So, this is a very simple problem that you've already seen in your homework earlier, right? So, I give you n jobs, right? And each job has a size, S1, S2, S, the sizes n jobs are of sizes S1, S2, Sn. So, they're just numbers, non-negative numbers, 10, 5, 3, 2, whatever, right? n jobs and have m machines, okay, m identical machines, right, These are, I have many processors that I can schedule these jobs on. So what is, I mean there are many objectives people study, you know, it's a, it's a very simple problem. I want to put these jobs on the machines so that I minimize some objective, right. One simple objective is I want to minimize the maximum load of any machine, okay. So you can think of it as a simply a packing problem, right? I have M bins, right? And I have these jobs of different sizes and I want to put these jobs as evenly as possible basically, right? On this machine so that I minimize the maximum load of the machines. Yeah? Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So why is it NP hard by the way? What, why I claim this problem is NP hard. Why? Which problem do you think will uh, show that this problem is NP hard? Which among the problems we have seen already? Some number problems we have seen, right? What is a number problem that we have seen? Yeah? Set cover? Set cover is not a number problem, no? Set cover is uh, more like a sets and elements. Here there are no just some numbers and some machines. So, so set cover is more combinatorial problem. Here the numbers are involved. No, integer linear programming is, it's more general than this, no? I want you to find a problem so that if you solve this, you can solve that problem. You want to find a problem that will reduce to this problem. This can easily be reduced to integer programming. How do you prove that this problem is hard? To prove that this problem is hard, you have to take an existing hard problem and reduce it to this problem, right? So even think of m equal to 2. I claim m equal to 2 is NP hard. That means just two machines. What is the problem of, if I have two machines and I have a bunch of numbers, what does it mean to schedule them as evenly as possible? Right? When can I do the best? What is the best I can do? If I can, right, you know, do you remember the two partition problem or the partition problem, right? What is the partition problem? I give you a bunch of numbers and I want to split them into two sets such that their sums are exactly equal, right? Okay, is there a partition of the numbers so that their sums are exactly equal? Yeah? So, if I know, if I have this problem, how can I reduce two partition to this? I take the same numbers and say I have two machines, right? If you schedule them, what is the best way to schedule them evenly? If, if, they, if I can partition the numbers into two sets such that their sums are equal, then they'll be exactly, they'll all pack nicely, right? The two machines, and if and only if. If I can't partition them, one guy will be bigger than the other guy, right? Yeah? So you can reduce two partition to this problem, and so it is NP complete, okay? Even with two machines, it's NP complete. Okay? Is that kind of clear? Okay? It's in fact, you can prove that if the number of machines is large, it's actually what is called strongly NP complete, that even if the numbers are written in unary, it is NP complete. Okay? For the partition, if two machines, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's actually you can solve in pseudo polynomial. Okay? So let's not worry about, uh, I mean, that you can prove that it's NP complete fairly easily if you know two partition. But here, you know, I want us to think of algorithms, right, heuristic algorithms. What kind of heuristic algorithms can we come up with and how do we analyze them? More importantly, how do we analyze them, right? And, and just some flavor of, you know, what, how to think about heuristics, understand some special cases, just to get a flavor of, of how to think about approximation. So what is the natural heuristic for this problem? Yeah. So, uh, 
Okay, so maybe that's a little bit less precise. Make it a little bit more precise. You'll start with the biggest job. Okay, so he's sorting the jobs, saying the biggest job goes first, right? He sorts the, he's sorting the jobs, and he's putting it on, at each point you have a job you need to assign, you assign it to the least loaded machine, right? Yeah? That's what he is, right? Is that a reasonable heuristic? Yeah? Okay. So that's a reasonable heuristic, right? I'm going to do even simpler heuristic just to do some analysis, right? Which is, I'm not even going to sort the jobs, okay? I mean, it makes sense to... Uh, 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 sort the jobs, but let's say we don't even sort the jobs, okay? We just do it in any order we want. And we'll see later why that's not such a great idea, and if you sort it, why it's a little bit better idea, yeah? Okay, so th this is called, um, I mean, what is the advantage of not sorting, by the way? If you don't sort, and if you can prove something, we can then make that algorithm online, right? Even if the jobs are coming one by one, we can still understand what it will do, right? If you have to sort, it means that you need to know all the jobs in advance, right? So it's kind of useful to understand if, what if you don't sort, the jobs are coming one by one and I'll just put every job on the least loaded machine currently, right? Yeah, that's called uh, 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 list scheduling and that's, you start with some ordering of the jobs, any ordering, right? We'll see later on that the natural, better thing to do is to sort it according to the sizes, but Okay, we, we want to schedule it on the least loaded motion, right? Okay, let's do this order, right? We have M machine, so what is a good way of uh, thinking about it? Some people think of time as, you know, there are two ways of thinking about this problem. Time is going left to right, or time, or if you think of it as putting blocks on a Tetris or something, we're going up. I like the going up kind of way of thinking about it, it's equivalent. So, uh, uh, let's do, uh, what happens, you know, I, I'm going to draw um, uh, sort of uh, uh, three machines are like this, right, you know, M1, M2, M3. So, the first job, four, right, uh, we're going to put this four here. I'm going to not do it to scale, but we'll roughly, okay. And then the second job, you know, what will you do? We'll put it on what? Here, right? Right? And then the, this guy will go here, right? Okay, then what happens? When 2 comes, where should we put it? On, we'll put it here, right? Clearly it is not to scale, right? you know, but that will be even, right? And then 5 comes, where should it go? We have a choice now. There are two machines with the... So let's put it, you know, on the, maybe we'll put it on uh, this guy, uh, five, and then uh, what happens to when six comes? It'll go on here, right? Okay, and then nine comes. So it'll go on, on the, well, you know, now I'm going to be out of uh, nine, and then seven comes, it'll go on this, right? Right? So what is the load we get? This guy has a load of, I mean, this guy has a load of 9, this guy has a load of 13, and this guy has a load of 15, right? No, what is it? 15, right? So that is our load, right? Yeah? Okay. All right. How good is this algorithm? Okay, I mean, in the sense that, you know, will it always give an optimum schedule? You can easily convince yourself of examples where it won't give the optimum schedule, right? Okay, uh, can you prove something about how good the algorithm is? That what is the load of this algorithm, the maximum load, the make span it is called, compared to the optimum possible for this, right? Okay. Okay, how do we think about it, right? You know, when you want to think about proving things like this, we have to say, why is this problem np complete? Why is it hard, right? The reason why it is hard is because we don't know how to understand what is the optimal solution in a good way, right? So we need to think of proxies for the optimal solution. So let's try to understand, can we think of a lower bound on the optimum value? If I give you a bunch of numbers and say, what is the minimum possible even? 
right? What is the lower bound on the optimum value, right? What is the minimum load you can ever get? What are some lower bounds on, on that we can compute? Yeah? Yeah, so the total load divided by the number of machines is a lower bound, right? Nobody can do better than that, right? Why is that? Yeah, I mean, by just by, you know, if, if you can go below that, then it will you'll get a contradiction to the total amount of work that the machines are doing, right? Right? You see, the average load is a lower bound on the optimum value, right? Yeah? Okay. So that's one lower bound. What about another lower bound? Sometimes, in, when, is it a when is it a bad lower bound? The average load is not a good lower bound in some cases, right? Why is that? When is that the bad lower bound? If all the jobs are, say, size 1, is the average load a good lower bound? In fact, if all the jobs are of size 1 or equal size, then the average load is optimal, actually. You can easily prove that, right? If all the jobs are the same size, what should you do? You should evenly spread them around, right? And you can convince yourself that it's optimum action. Yeah? Okay. But if, when is it not good? Yeah? Uh, also the largest block. Yeah, if there's a very big job, then that's also a lower bound, right? If you have one big job and nothing else, clearly you can't do better than that, right? So the two lower bounds which are natural are... Uh, 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 the average load, right, optimum schedule length has to be at least the sum of the job sizes divided by M, right, that's the average load, and it's also the maximum job size, right, okay. Okay, now, you know, we know this lower bounds, can we argue that the load that this greedy algorithm produces is comparable, how do we analyze that, right, if we can prove that the load that this greedy algorithm produces is comparable to these lower bounds, then you can compare it to optimum, right? We can't understand optimum directly because it's hard to compute directly, right? So we analyze algorithms by coming up with the lower bounds and then thinking how can we compare our algorithm's output to some lower bounds that we can understand, okay? So here is how we can prove that, you know, we can prove the following result that the load of the greedy algorithm is always no more than two times opt, okay? In fact, it's slightly better than two, it is two times one minus one over m, okay, times opt, all right? Uh, all right, uh, let's, let's try to prove this. Let's think it's a two times opt, right? I'll never be worse than two times opt. And we'll see an example where it can be as bad as two times opt. Okay, so how do we prove this? Okay, whatever the order, the order doesn't matter, right? I mean, the order does matter, but this is saying, you know, for every order, I can guarantee that the greedy algorithm is is, is no more than two times opt. Okay, okay. So what is L here? The load of the greedy algorithm, right? Okay. Okay, let's, I mean, here is an analysis, right? You know, it's, it's not obvious if you've not seen this kind of thing before. Okay, we, so what happens? We, 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 uh, we look at the example, right? You know, what did we do, right? You know, which one was the machine with the highest load in this, in this order? M2, right? Okay? So, we don't, in general, you know, let's say MH is the machine which had the highest load in the algorithm, right? And let's look at the last job that we scheduled on that machine. And let's call that ith job, right? I don't know what I is and I don't know what H is, but there exists such a, after we finish the algorithm, we can look and say, which machine had the highest load and who was the last job we scheduled on that machine? Yeah? Okay, that's the, that's the notation. Uh, uh, so, MH is a machine which achieves the load L, the maximum load that the, that the algorithm re, uh, had, and I is the job that was last scheduled on that, right? Okay? Okay. So, why did we schedule that last job on that machine? At that point, why did I schedule that job on that machine? 
Because at that point, everybody had that, that was the minimum load machine, right? Yeah? So let's, you know, so, um, so how does a picture look like, right? The picture looks uh, uh, like this, right? Um, oh, no. Oh, okay. Not restart, please. Okay, so uh, let's see how the picture looks like, right? Uh, so all, okay, so this is M1, M2, MH, I mean, sorry, MH is here and M sub M. So this is the height, right? So when did we schedule this last job? We scheduled this job. This is SI, right? Okay. So this is the load, the maximum loaded machine that we had, right? So why did we schedule SI there? Well, because every job, every machine had a load of at least L minus SI at that point. Yeah? Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be the, right? Yeah? So we know that all these machines had what? This load of at least L minus SI. Yeah? Okay. So, what can we say about this? Let's call this L minus SI. That means all these machines are busy, right? See, all of them are full. Can we say that the optimum value is at least this much height, L minus SI? Why? I claim L minus SI must be less than the average load, right? Yeah? Because all these guys are busy by that uh, till, right? Everybody is full. Yeah? If everybody is full, they, that L minus SI cannot be more than the average load, right? If it is bigger than the average load, what does it mean? Everybody is doing more work than the average load. But that means that that is more than the total sum of the jobs, right? That's not possible, right? So, since everybody is busy, this height must be less than the average load. Yeah? Okay? So, then what is our load? Our load is this plus one job, right? Because remember, this is the last job that we scheduled on this machine, right? So, what is our load? Our load is the size of SI plus at most the average load. Right? So we are, but this is no more than the optimum load, right? Because that's, each job is of length less than or equal to the optimum load. So our height is not more than two times the optimum load. Okay, let's go over that argument again. Okay. <laughs> So we are looking at our schedule, right? The schedule created by the greedy algorithm. And we say, oh, why did we have a load of L? The L is the, the maximum load of any machine in our thing, right? So we said, okay, which machine had that maximum load? There could be many machines, but let's fix one machine, right? And we say, ah, okay, this guy had the maximum load, right? You know, you say, okay, why did we have that maximum load on that machine? Okay, well, who, who, who was the last job that was scheduled on that machine? We don't know what it is, let's call it SI, right? So it's okay, we say, okay, why did we schedule SI? That was the last job, right? So L minus SI is uh, at the point when we schedule SI, this job, we, we looked at all the jobs, right? He, he came in, in the order somewhere and we said, ah, okay, why did we schedule SI on that machine? It means that this guy at that point had the least load among all machines, which means that every machine had load at least L minus SI. But that means L, but everybody is busy working, had a height of L minus SI, which means L minus SI can, has to be less than average load, right? If L minus SI is bigger than the average load, we'll get a contradiction, right? Because uh, the total work done by the machines is more than the total sum of the jobs, which is not feasible, right? So we get two things. L minus SI is less than, and in fact, we get a slightly stronger thing, L equal to 1 to I minus 1, SL divided by M, right? In fact, when ith job is scheduled, already we know that the, that the average load is no more than the first I minus 1 jobs, right? 
In fact, we can say the first i minus 1 jobs, the sum of the first i minus 1 jobs, the average load of those jobs has to be uh, less, L minus S has to be less than that, which is a little stronger than saying it is a sum, less than the sum of all, average of all the jobs. Okay? Don't worry about that. We know it is less than the average thing. And SI itself is less than, this is less than opt, right? Because the average load is at most opt. And SI is less than opt, right? So L is less than SI plus average load. So it is a less than opt plus opt. So it's less than 2 opt. So in fact, we get a slightly stronger analysis, right? We also get the property that if all jobs are very small, how much are we, we are not very bad, right? We are getting average load plus the maximum job size. If for some reason all your jobs are very tiny compared to the average load, we actually, the algorithm is going to do much better, right? Suppose I guarantee you that, you know, each job is very small compared to the average load. Then our algorithm, our analysis says that ah, it's okay, the algorithm is very good, it evenly distributes everything, right? That's intuitive, right? If all jobs are of size 1, you can actually prove it is optimal, right? Uh, here we're saying, ah, if, uh, the only reason why you will have a bad situation is that you had a very long job and, and you didn't do such a good job of that, right? Some jobs are bigger than other jobs and they're comparable, okay? Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, uh, you know, you can prove slightly tighter bound, uh, but I, I, you, I let you uh, read that. So now we can ask, okay, did we do the analysis properly or is it just that you proved that the algorithm is at most two times optimal, but maybe it's actually better than that and you just didn't prove it properly. Maybe it is no more than 1.8 times optimum, but you, you just didn't do the analysis properly, right? We can ask that question, right? Is it the case? Of course, if all the jobs are unit size, we are going to get an optimal solution, right? Okay, and the analysis doesn't always say that directly. But you can ask, you know, maybe the algorithm is actually 1.5 times optimum and you are only able to prove 2 because you used a weak analysis. Or is it the case that there is some instance on which the algorithm is going to be, in the worst case, 2 times optimum? And what does it mean? That means that there is some instance where your analysis is tight. You can't do any better on that instance, right? So your analysis is not weak. It's just the algorithm can be as bad as two times opt. So when is this algorithm not so good? Can you think of an example where this algorithm is not the right thing? He said, right, sort the jobs. That makes sense, right? So if you don't sort the jobs, why is it bad? Large. Yeah, if the last job is extremely large, what happens? You spread all the other jobs evenly and this guy will stick out, no? Okay, so let's think of the example very formally. So here is an example, right? I have M machines. I have a lot of size 1 jobs. How many of them? M times M minus 1. Okay? And one job which is of size M. Okay? Okay, suppose I put the last, the, all the one jobs, size 1 jobs come first and then the last big job comes at the very end. What will the algorithm do? So it has size 1 jobs. How many of them are there? M times M minus 1, right? So what is it going to do with those M times M minus 1 size 1 jobs? It will spread them evenly, right? They are like small piece of sand, right? So what will it do? It will put... Um, okay, okay. Okay, so what is it going to do? It's going to put one here, one here, one here, one here, and then it's going to put what will be the height of this after all the size one jobs are done? Sorry? They are m times m minus one divided by m, right? It will spread them evenly, right? So the height of this will be, okay, then you get a size M job, what are you going to do? You have to put it somewhere, no? You have to put it, okay. So you stick this uh, size M job here, right? So what is the length of our schedule? M plus 2M minus 1, right? What is the optimum schedule here? 
m, right? You put the big job one, and then you spread the m times m minus one jobs evenly on the m minus one machines. Okay, the optimum is what m, while we are getting two m minus one. Okay, so it can be. So in this case, the ratio is what two m minus one divided by m, right? Which is two minus one over m. So actually, yeah. So I, I made a mistake here. It should be. Um, uh, it should be not, uh, this is, doesn't make sense because uh, uh, th this should be um, 2 minus 1 over m. Okay. No, the, uh, I'll, I'll fix it. Okay. This should be uh, 2 minus 1 over m. Okay. Mm. Okay, um, okay, does it make sense? So our analysis is not weak, it can really bad algorithm if you don't solve the jobs, right? Okay, make sense? So, okay, so, okay, good, you know, we, it's a very natural algorithm, you know, it can be bad in this case, but it no worse than two at any point, okay? Okay, so, uh, the natural heuristic is, okay, let's sort the jobs, and order them uh, biggest to smallest and then run the same algorithm, but now we are sorting the jobs. How well does it do? Okay, you can ask that question, right? Does it give us a better algorithm? I mean, heuristically it will do better, right? It, it seems to make more sense, right? And, and for example, on that, pro, on that instance it will do optimal. So in the worst case, you can ask the question, in the worst case, can you guarantee that it does better? or what is its worst case performance, right? Can you prove something better? And in fact, you can. You can prove that it is actually will never give you more than four thirds the optimum value. Okay? And moreover, it is tight. That means there is an instance where it will be as bad as four thirds. Okay, it's a little, I mean, I'm cheating a little bit. There, there is some uh, smaller order term, it depends on M, but I'm being giving a li little higher level, right? The small order term doesn't matter, like 2 minus 1 over m, there is a minus some small thing that depends on m. Let's not worry about it. So it is indeed a better algorithm, okay? All right? But it's not, there are examples though where it is going to be as bad as 4 thirds and it's never bad, worse than 4 thirds. So there too we have a tight analysis. It's not always the case that we get a tight analysis. Sometimes you are able to prove that it's no worse than 4 thirds. But we are not completely sure, we are not able to, all, it's, there are examples which is at least as bad as, you know, 1.2, but it's no worse than 4 thirds. Sometimes there is a gap between what we can prove uh, about its performance and uh, in terms of the upper bound and the lower bound. In this case, it turns out that we know the right answer, in the worst case. That is, never do worse than 4 thirds, it will do as bad as 4 thirds in some examples, okay? How do we prove this, right? This is a little bit harder, okay? to prove, right? The algorithm hasn't changed much, right? We just made the jobs, sorted the jobs. So, well, you know, that is a big change in some ways, but how do we analyze it, right? Okay, it turns out to be a little tricky, but it is, a, I will do a slightly weaker analysis. I will prove to you that it is no worse than three halves. Four thirds requires more case analysis. I'll do three halves, okay? It's interesting, right? You know, to prove that you can prove the three halves. But even there, you know, we, we need a, we need a, to think a little bit. Uh, it's not completely obvious, even three, right? Okay, so to understand uh, why it is not obvious, we have to ask ourselves the question, how did we analyze the previous algorithm, right? We analyze the previous algorithm by thinking of two lower bounds for the, on the optimum value. What are those two lower bounds? The average load and the maximum job size, okay? My claim is that if you use only those two lower bounds, you cannot prove a ratio better than two. What does that mean? Okay, to understand what even I'm saying, let's think of this example. There are m plus one jobs, each of size one. Okay. What is the optimal solution if I have m plus one jobs, each of size one? Two, right? You know, we just put the first m jobs, 
and then the next job has to go somewhere and they're all equal size so it is two right yeah okay but let's look at our lower bounds what is the maximum job size one what is the average load 1 plus 1 over m, right? Yeah? Is m plus 1 divided by m, right? So if m is big, those two lower bounds are saying the optimum is at least about 1 plus 1 over m, right? Well, but the optimum is actually 2, right? So if you just think, if you use only those two lower bounds, we are not getting a, a enough, we, we, we can't prove a ratio better than 2 because optimum, the in, uh, actual optimum is 2 while the lower bounds are roughly giving only 1. If you have any reasoning which uses only those two lower bounds, you cannot prove a bound better than 2. Right? Does it make sense a little bit? Yeah, that how can you, I mean all we know is optimum is at least 1, but the real optimum is 2. So there is no way we can argue that it, is, it has to be 2 at least, right? Okay. So, we can think of a slightly, we need to think of a slightly different lower bound which will help us with this case, okay. And that is the following simple looking lower bound, right. Uh, here, is a, here is a nice lower bound. Suppose we sort the jobs uh, in decreasing order, S1, S2, S up to Sn. And for simplicity, assume that N is bigger than M. If N is less than M, is the problem easy? Right? N is less than equal to M, the problem is easy, right? You just put one job on each machine. Right? Okay, so the interesting case is when is N is bigger than M, then I claim opt has to be at least the size of the Mth job plus the size of the M plus first job together, combined. Why is that? Okay. No, maybe it's stacked on something smaller, you know. I mean, it's, the intuition is correct, but let's try to be a little bit formal. Yeah. So the first M job each goes on the machine, and then the M plus one job has to go on the smallest one, which will be the Mth job. No, no, but why should they all go on the small? The, the, a little bit careful. I'm being a pedantic, partly because why should the first M jobs go on different, different? Uh, Machines. No, no, no. I'm not. See, remember, I'm not arguing this about our schedule. I'm saying that any schedule. When I say opt is bigger than this, I'm saying any schedule must have that property. I'm not asking about our. This is not. I mean, I can. I mean, the optimal schedule could be some funky thing, no? So you're not. We're not arguing about our algorithm which sorts the jobs. This is saying, you know, this is saying, you know, any schedule must have that lower bound. I'm lower bounding the optimum value. I mean, you guys have the right intuition, but I'm just trying to be very careful on what we are saying here. He's saying that no matter, the, the optimum value is, is at least this much. It's different from saying our algorithm does something. This is like, I'm not talking about our algorithm. This is saying any algorithm must pay at least that much. Okay. Ah, yes, you are correct. So let us first focus only on the first m plus 1 jobs. Clearly a lower bound on the first m plus 1 jobs is going to be lower bound for the more jobs, right? Yeah? Okay, so let us focus on the first m plus 1 jobs. Then what can we say? So we restrict our attention to the first m plus 1 jobs in the sorted order. And if I can argue that for only the smaller subset of jobs, the opt is at least this much, then I am done, right? But now do you see the argument if I restrict myself to first m plus 1 jobs? By pigeonhole principle, two of them must go on the sum machine, no? Well, you know, what are the sizes of those two jobs? Well, you know, they have to, the sum of the job sizes must be at least the two smallest jobs I have in my instance, right? Yeah? And these two are the smallest jobs I have, right? So the, their sum must be at least the two smallest job sizes. 
So it is, you know, you, intuitively you see it, but you have a little bit more formal than, than confusing the algorithm versus the optimum, right? So it's just a little bit more careful than a reasoning, right? Yeah? You are convinced? Okay. Okay, so now look at the instance where I have m plus 1 jobs of size 1. What does this lower bound give me? It gives me 2, right? Right, because I have m plus 1 jobs and uh, the mth job is size 1, m plus 1 job is size 1, so optimum has to be at least 2. So we are getting a better load bound than the average load or the maximum job size. Yeah? Make sense or no? Seems a little tricky. Okay. So this is the lower bound. We know that this is true. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's now prove that if you sort the jobs in decreasing order and thus do the greedy algorithm, we will get a schedule which is no more than three halves times optimum. Okay. In fact, it's actually four thirds, but I'm going to do a slightly easier proof which will give you three halves. Okay. It's a little bit less case analysis. Okay. Let's do the same thing, right? You know, we are going to again say, you know, how did we get L? Okay. Okay. So we're going to look at the same picture. But we'll have some slight advantage, right? Oh, I'm going the other way. <laughs> Sorry. Let's look at how we analyze the Okay, what did we do here? We look at again instead of which machine got the highest load, okay, MH, who did we schedule at the last on the job SI. So what is the advantage we have in this new algorithm? What can we say? We can say that all the jobs which came before SI are at least as big as SI, right, because we sorted the jobs, right. That's the only advantage we have now, right, agreed? So maybe that will help us, right. Because we schedule all the bigger jobs, so the SI must be a little bit smaller than those big jobs, right? So maybe uh, we'll get uh, something, right? Okay. So okay, can you think of uh, how we should be, I mean, we have to use the new lower bound, otherwise we know we cannot, okay? Okay, one case is that SI is the only job on that machine. Then what can we say? Then we must be optimum, no? Yeah? Agreed? Okay, other case is SI has somebody else is sitting on that machine already, right? Before SI came. Okay? So then can we say something about uh, how big SI is? See, we can say this, right? We still have this L minus SI is less than the average load. And our schedule length is L minus SI plus SI, right? If I can argue that SI is at most opt over 2, I'll be happy, right? If I can argue that SI is at most opt over 2, then I get average load plus opt over 2, so opt plus opt over 2, right? So I want to argue that this job must know is no more than opt over 2, okay? Okay, so let's see why that is the case, right? So let's, let, we are doing the same analysis, we are doing a little bit more careful. Okay. So case 1, if SI is the only job on MJ, uh, then we are clearly optimal, right? Okay. Otherwise, there is one more job on MJ before SI. Okay. At least one more job, maybe more than one job, right? Let's call that job uh, uh, something else, right? We will see why it is. We have already seen that L minus SI is less than opt, right? Because it's at most the average load. Okay. Now I am going to claim that SI is less than or equal to opt over 2. Okay, we'll prove that. Suppose it is true, then L is less than opt plus SI is less than 3 opt over 2. Yeah? Okay. So now how why am I guaranteeing you that SI is uh, um, okay? So since MJ had a job before SI, we know that I has to be greater than M. Why? 
I mean, you know, if i is less than or equal to m, I would put it on its own machine, right? So it means i is bigger than m, right? Yeah? So what can I say about si? Well, si must be less than or equal to sm plus 1, right? It could be bigger, I mean, it can't be bigger. It may be equal to sm plus 1, right? Yeah? So si is less than or equal to sm plus 1 because jobs were sorted, right? Well, we know that opt is at least 2 times sm plus 1. It's bigger than, opt is, remember, is bigger than sm plus sm plus 1, but which is, it is greater than 2 sm plus 1. So opt is bigger than 2 times sm plus 1, and our job is less than sm plus 1, so our job size is at most opt over 2. Okay, and that's it, that's the proof. Okay, so it's a saying that, you know, basically, since we sorted the jobs, if my, the, 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 any job which is more than m plus 1 is no more than half the optimum value, right? So the only way that job will stack on something else is that it is not going to be too big compared to opt. It has to be at most half of the optimum value, okay? Yeah. You can get four thirds by being careful and saying, what if there are two jobs? And, you know, you say, I know, versus one job, and if you do a little bit more case analysis, it's not completely obvious, then you can get four thirds, and the surprising thing is that that is tight, that why can't I analyze three jobs and all that stuff, but it's tight, okay? All right? Okay, so that's, so, so, two things we need to understand from this, right? One is, we, we you know, the heuristic is very intuitive, no? The heuristic is very intuitive. The analysis tells us what are the, I mean, the analysis is revealing in two ways. One, it tells us, you know, oh, it will never do any worse than this. That's just a number, right? But it also reveals more, right? It says what are the easy cases. The easy case from the analysis is, which is, again, you know, if you think about it, it's not very hard in this particular case. Ah, if all the jobs are very small compared to the average load, the algorithm should do well, right? Because it will spread the jobs evenly. It's not going to do too terribly. So what is the difficult case? The difficult case is some jobs are very big and some jobs are uh, not so big, in which case you have to make sure that you schedule the big jobs first, right? Okay, that still doesn't say that, you know, uh, you, maybe all my jobs are fairly big. That is still not an easy case because the greedy algorithm can, in fact, be as bad as four-thirds. You might say four-thirds is better than two, but it's still not, not so, you know, it, it, it is still four-thirds, right? Maybe you can do closer to optimum, right? So in fact, for this particular problem, it is sufficiently easy, one can prove, and there's a homework problem which is not trivial, it's just, a, it's just for you to, if you're interested to think about it, it's not too hard either. You can prove that for any epsilon greater than zero, you can get a, a one plus epsilon approximation in polynomial time, right? So that means that if you, if a, this is not a very hard problem in certain ways, right? And if you want a, say, 1.01 approximation, you can get it in polynomial time. But the running time will increase exponentially in 0.01, right? 1 over 1.01. So as the error gets, uh, as you get better guarantee, you'll, you'll, you'll have to pay more in the running time. Okay? So that's called a polynomial time approximation scheme. That is, as the epsilon is getting uh, smaller, you can get better and better approximation, as close to optimum as you want, but the running time will have to grow exponentially in epsilon. Okay? So this is somewhat an easier problem, right? Okay, but but uh, you can see that already this. Uh, any questions? This is one of the simplest scheduling problems. There are many variations. You know, uh, I hope you got a flavor of you know what why lower bounds are important. How to think about bad examples to understand whether the analysis is tight. Which examples are tight for what lower bounds? Right? How should we tweak the algorithm a little bit? All very simple in this case, but still already it reveals some non-trivial uh, analysis structure. Okay? Okay. We're going to do one more problem and then we'll stop. Okay? So this is a set cover problem. This is a very fundamental problem. Uh, again, because uh, even though the problem is abstract, because it's abstract, uh, it comes up uh, in um, many settings implicitly, and that's why it's a valuable problem to have a sense of, right? You know, 
Okay, what is uh, the set cover problem, right? It's an abstract world. I have n elements. I have many sets. I want to find the smallest number of sets that cover all the elements, right? So, what is a good way of thinking about it? Here is, you know, I give you some bunch of points in the plane, okay, say. And then, you know, I give you some shapes, say, Okay, that's enough maybe, <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, now I ask, you know, I, look, you know, I, I, if I take all the shapes, I'll cover all the points, right? Okay. But I say, I don't want to take all the shapes. I want to take as few shapes as possible to cover all my points. That's set cover. Yeah? Okay, so these are the points, you know, these are uh, sets, right? Each shape is a set, right? It covers some points, right? Yeah? Okay? So it's abstract and that's why it is powerful. Here, you know, it's nice to see a concrete example, right? It's called, you know, you, this is a hypergraph. You can think of this as a hypergraph. What is a hypergraph? You know, these are, you can think of this as vertices, right? Uh, the points as vertices and now the edges are, I mean, are, are sets, right? They are bigger, they are not two element sets, they can be big. So it's called a hypergraph sometimes, right? Hypergraph is nothing but a set system, right? Okay. Each set becomes a big, big edge like this, a shape. Okay, it's called a hypergraph. Okay, different name. Right? If you see a hypergraph, don't worry, it's just a set system. Okay, it's just like that. Okay. Okay. So, what is the natural greedy algorithm for this problem? Find the largest set, take out all those points, right? Yeah. And then uh, basically recurs on the remaining instance, right? Find the next largest set. But when you say next largest, you should not count what you've already covered, right? Yeah? Make sense? Okay. So this is the algorithm, right? Initially, uh, uncover is everything, right? We didn't cover anything. So while there are still things that are uncovered, pick the set that covers the most number of uncovered elements, right? Add it to your collection and keep doing it and remove the, un I mean, uh, uh, adjust the uh, uncovered elements, right? You, you know, you have to make sure that you remove all the elements that are covered by the new set and update uncovered, yeah? Very simple algorithm, right? So this is a very natural algorithm, occurs in many sort of situations and, and so it's, a, uh, it's, it's good to understand what does it do, okay? And the analysis is, is sort of similar to we already saw the basics of this analysis once before, when we were doing flow. Do you remember roughly what kind of... So that's why it's good to know the analysis, whether you like this problem or not, right? Remember we had this algorithm, which is the... When you're doing augmenting path algorithm, one of the things we tried was to prove that there's a polynomial. Ford Fulkerson can take a long time because it is not paying attention to what paths, right? There are two variations we discussed. One was always find the shortest augmenting path. The other was find the biggest pipe. Okay. Why is that good? Because that's like a greedy algorithm, right? At each time it is trying to find the fattest thing that it can do, right? It sort of has the same flavor and in fact the analysis will be very similar. Okay. Okay. You're trying to find the biggest thing you can do and take it out greedily, right? Okay. Okay. Make sense? The algorithm is clear? I, I don't have to do a run an example, right? It's very simple to do this. Okay. Uh, so how do we analyze this? So to analyze this, you know, we'll see how bad is it, you know, if there is a very small solution, how, how, how good is our solution, right? How many sets are we going to output compared to the, the optimal number of sets? That's what we want to understand. Okay. To make sense of that, let's put some notation. K star is the number of sets in the optimal solution. Right? There is some very nice K star collection. And K is the number of uh, sets that the algorithm outputs. How many uh, sets do we output? It's the same as the number of iterations of this algorithm, right? Yeah? In each iteration, we have K, add one set. So, 
K is the number of iterations before the algorithm finishes everything. Okay, that's the number of sets. We want to understand, you know, how big is K compared to K star, right? Okay, so what happens? In each iteration, we cover some more elements, right? Okay, alpha i is the number of elements we cover in the ith iteration. Okay, all right? That's how many in the ith iteration we cover. And beta i is the number of elements that remain uncovered after we finish iteration i. Okay, is that okay? So what is beta 0 in the, beta 0 means basically that we have not started the algorithm, right? Beta 0 is n, we will define beta 0 to be n. At the beginning of the algorithm, the 0th iteration did not start. So beta 0 is what? n, which is the total number of elements that you need to call. Is that clear? So okay, what happens? So we start with n, in the first iteration we cover what? Alpha 1. And the second iteration, so, so if you think of it is what do you have? We have n, right, in the beginning, this is beta 0, and then we cover alpha 1, and so beta 1 is n minus alpha 1, right, and then we cover alpha 2, right, and beta 2 is beta 1 minus alpha 2, right, and, and so on, right, yeah, and then eventually we will finish cover everything. The algorithm will terminate because at each iteration it covers at least one element, right? So, and it's a simple algorithm. So, how many iterations do we take? Okay. My claim is that you know the same kind of thing that we did in the flow is true. I can claim that the number of elements I cover in iteration i is at least beta i minus one divided by k star. Okay. What is he saying? Let us go back to this picture. In the first iteration, how many do you think I should I would be able to cover? What can I say? So I had n elements, right? Yeah? What do you think will happen in the first iteration? What can we say about how many elements we cover in the first iteration? Maybe we cover a lot, no? But I'm trying to say, you know, we'll cover at least so much. We can't be like completely stupid, right? Is what I'm trying to say. Okay, but what, what does that mean, completely stupid? We are picking the very the biggest set we can, right? So what can we say about how many elements in that set will be there? So well, you know, it depends on the instance, no? Okay, so we are trying to compare it with. We can't, see, depending on the instance, we can't immediately say how many we cover. But what we can say is that if optimum is covering all the n elements using only k star sets, okay, that means we should be able to cover at least what the optimum is doing on average, right? What is the average number of elements that optimum is covering? n over k star, right? Yeah? I mean, it, it ha there has to be a set of size at least n over k star. Yeah? Agreed? Okay, so we can claim that in the first iteration, we are going to cover at least n over k star elements, right? Because we are picking the biggest set there is out there, right? Optimum clearly has a set which covers at least n over k star. If it has no set which covers at least n over k star, together it cannot cover all n elements in k star using k star sets. Yeah? Okay? Can we make that argument? Yeah? Okay, so that's all the argument is. But we can apply the argument even for the second iteration, right? In the second iteration, what can we say? Well, it depends on how many are left uncovered, no? At the end of the previous iteration. Suppose there are beta 1 elements left uncovered after the end of the first iteration, right? That's what it means. The definition is after the end of the first iteration, then we still have beta 1 elements left to cover. Okay. My claim is in the second iteration, well, you know, all those elements could be covered by the optimum using k star sets. No? Those, you can still take those same k star sets, the optimum sets, and say, oh, look, they can cover all these n elements. Forget, you know, my beta 1 elements. They can cover n elements. So they clearly cover all these remaining elements too. So there must be a set in the uncovered, in the restricted instance, which covers at least beta 1 over k star sets. Remember, I am not changing k star. k star stays the same. Is that point clear? Hmm? At any step, 
I know that there exists K star sets which can cover all the remaining uncovered elements, right? So I, uh, the best set I'm going to pick at that point should cover at least the remaining elements divided by K star, yeah? So that's it. That is the basic fundamental simple analysis idea. That's all. There is nothing after that it's algebra, okay? So, so the, the, the idea is that the amount we cover is at least as good as the residual divided by the optimum disk size. This is the same analysis we did in the flow algorithm, right? We said there is a lot of flow to, to cover and we know that any flow can be decomposed into m paths. So the best flow path we take must cover whatever is a residual divided by m. Okay, here we replace that m with k star, whatever is the optimum value. Okay? So this is a very recurring what you call analysis equation. I mean, you know, if, if, if you had any process where the progress you make in that step is proportional to how far away you are from the optimum, right, then this kind of analysis comes into play, like gradient descent, you know, set cover, flow algorithm. So it's a recurring analysis theme, okay. So then, you know, so it's good to, good to, uh, so now we have to do some algebra, right? You know, you know, it, 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 it is, uh, it is one of those things where um, you have to just get used to it, okay? It's like saying, you know, uh, the, the geometric series converges. So what is it, what, what, what is the value of that in an algorithm design, right? You say, okay, if I have an algorithm which will take some amount of time and cuts down the problem size to a constant factor, then I can recurse and then I'll get some converging series, right? So that's just a simple idea, but the algebra you have to kind of get used to, okay? So let's do some algebra because it's not completely, I mean, it, 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 you know, you have to memorize it almost at, if you are going to use it again and again. Okay, so what is beta i, right? Beta i is the number of elements that are left at the end of iteration i. Well, what is that? It is beta i minus 1 minus alpha i, right? That is the number of elements which are left after i minus 1 iterations minus how many hour we covered in, in the ith iteration. Yeah? So th this, is, this is an equality, right? Beta i is beta i minus 1 minus alpha i. Yeah? Because this is the number left after i minus 1 iterations. This is how many we covered in i. Well, what do we know? We, well, b, alpha i is at least beta i minus 1 over k star, right? So we can say this is less than or equal to beta i minus 1 minus beta i minus 1 divided by k star. So this is equal to, I mean here it is equality, it is 1 minus 1 over k star times beta i minus 1, okay? So from this what we get is beta i is less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over k star times beta i minus 1, okay? That, that's all, okay? What is it saying? It is saying we make, we make progress at the rate of 1 minus 1 over k star in a relative sense. We are cutting the deficit down by 1 minus 1 over k star, okay? So if you have a big deficit, the actual uh, cutting down is going to be large because it's a relative fraction, right? The same relative fraction, this is not changing, right? This is the same factor, okay? So from this, you know, Again, by, what can we say? We can say beta i minus 1 is less than 1 minus 1 over k star times beta i minus 2, right? And that is less than 1 minus 1 over k star times beta i minus 3, right? And so we can go all the way and say beta i is less than beta 0 times 1 minus 1 over k star raised to the i. Yeah? Okay? Okay. So let me, okay. So what happens if I choose k, i equal to k star? In this equation, if I choose i equal to k star, what happens? That means I'm asking, after we picked k star sets, how much do we have left over? Okay? What is 1 minus k, 1 over k star raised to the k star? One over e, right? Yeah? 1 minus 1 over k to the k is what? Rough, less than or equal to 1 over e. So if you put that to here, you know, it says that after I pick k star sets, how many elements do I have left over? n over e elements left over at most, 
Okay, so what does it say? It says that after I picked k star sets, I only have a constant fraction of the elements remaining. Yeah? Okay, that, that's a very important. Does it make sense? What it says is that look, optimum is covering everything with k star sets, right? Everything with k star sets. What will greedy algorithm do after you after you pick k star sets? If it covers everything, clearly it's optimum, right? But maybe it doesn't cover everything. But what can we say that after it picks k star sets, even though we don't know what k star is, the number of elements left is no more than n over e. So it is covering a n. We are covering what? N times one minus one over e. Yeah. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, what is i? Right. I is the number of iterations of the algorithm. Right. After i iterations, this is how many are left over. Right. I'm saying that if an i equal to k star, which says that beta k star is less than n times one minus uh, one n over e. So beta k star is less than n over e. Okay. So okay. Now let's. So we can think of the greedy algorithm as restarting again. It has only n over e elements left. So if I pick another k star sets, how many elements will I have left? We started with n at most n over e. So we'll have at most n over e square sets le elements left. Okay. But how many elements together? How many sets did we pick? K star plus two k star. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. So now we only have n over e square. So now we again we apply the same analysis. We say okay. After another k star sets, we'll have n over e cube left, right? So how many times do you have to go like this before I have to like, more or less stop? Okay. If I do log n times k star times uh, sets, I have only n over e to the log n left over, right? E to the log n is what? N, right? E to the log n is n. So after log n times k star sets, I will basically have only one element left. Okay. So I mean, basically, the thing is the following, right? If I if I cut, you know, if I pay k star and cut the number of elements by half, okay, how many times do you have to cut the number of elements by half before you stop? Log n times you have to cut it, right? More or less, right? Okay, that's I mean, you can do it like that, or you can do it as if you just put k equal to k star log n. After that many iterations, you basically have only one more, only one element left. Okay, so either the algorithm terminates before that, or we can argue that after k star log n sets, it has only one element left, and clearly in each iteration, it will pick at least one more element, right? Okay, so so my my claim is that you know the algorithm will terminate in k star log n plus one. With k star log n plus one sets, right? So what does it mean? That means that I don't my greedy algorithm does not pay more than optimum times log n, right? So but see here we're not getting a constant factor, right? I'm only able to guarantee to you that if the n is big, I, my ratio is getting worse and worse, right? As n is becoming bigger, my approximation ratio is not staying fixed; it is going worse and worse. Right, but that's the nature of the problem, and and here is what we can conclude: greedy algorithm gives you a log n plus one approximation for set cover, and the amazing thing is that you cannot do better than this unless p equal to n p. Okay, this is a very non-trivial proof. So the greedy algorithm is optimal in the worst case, right? I mean, there is slight slack, but more or less you can't do anything better for this problem unless p equal to n p. Okay, and the algorithm generalizes the weighted case, many other uh, applications and stuff. Okay, okay. Now I want to say, you know, well, you know, this is one theorem, but we need to understand, you know, is it really the algorithm? Is it really bad, or you know, is our analysis bad, right? Let me give you a bad example of why the algorithm will do something bad, and it will behave as badly as we predicted. Okay. So here is a simple geometric example, which will roughly show you that it it will pick log n times more than the optimum sets. Okay, it's a very simple and beautiful and nice example. So there are there are two types. I mean, here I'll draw a picture for you. In fact, it's a geometric example.
this is like a matrix okay okay so it's a geometric example and I have uh, here is a uh, this guy has one, one. This guy has two, two. And in general, this guy has two to the i, two to the i, and two to the p, two to the p. Okay? Is, is, is the instance clear? One point here, one point here. Two points here, two points here. Two to the i points here, two to the i points here. Okay? 2 to the p points here, 2 to the p points here. Yeah? Okay? What is the optimal solution here? The two orange bars, right? Okay, but what will the greedy algorithm do? Which one will it pick first? It will pick this guy, right? Why? Because the number of elements in the orange bar is 1 plus 2 plus all the way to the 2 to the p is how much? 2 to the p plus 1 minus 1. Well, what about this big guy? 2 times 2 to the p is 2 to the p plus, plus 1, right? So, it is 1 better, right? So, it say, ah, the greedy algorithm will first pick this set, okay? And then it will pick the next set. I mean, there are many columns, right? There is, ah, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I shouldn't draw that, okay? You, you know, uh, you know. so there's one, it will pick the next blue set and then it will pick the next blue set, right? So, it will pick all the blue sets even though there's a very good two set solution, okay? And how bad are we? Well, roughly when the optimal solution is of size 2 while our solution is of size log n. I mean, it's not exactly ln n but if you make the uh, uh, example more complicated, you can really get all the way to ln n plus 1. But here it roughly shows log n, okay? Because n is the, the number of elements is uh, roughly 2 to the p and n is uh, 2 to the p plus 2 or something. And we pick p sets while optimum is picking 2 sets, right? Okay? So the greedy algorithm can be fooled, right? I mean, this is an extreme example, but very simple, right? Easy to understand geometric rectangles in the plane and still the greedy algorithm can do badly, okay? But then, of course, when the sets are more complicated, you know, you can make it more interesting as well, right? Okay? So, our analysis is not wrong. The greedy does as badly as this. And moreover, we know that in the worst case, no algorithm can do better than greedy in terms of the ratio. Okay? Okay? But set cover is a very abstract problem, okay? So, it has so many applications because it's such an abstract thing. So, people study many special cases. Vertex cover is one special case. What if all the sets are small? Can we do better? Right? See, in the here, you know, and indeed you can change it. If all the sets are small, the n becomes the size of the set, maximum size of the set. Same greedy algorithm will do better. It will give you a ln d approximation where d is a maximum set size. Okay. And, and so on and so forth, right. Um, so, uh, that, that's, you know, the, you know, the advantage of the greedy algorithm is also many times the sets are implicitly sitting there. The elements are clear, but the sets are not obvious, right? But you can still apply the greedy algorithm as long as you know what? You have an algorithm which at each step can do what? Pick the best set, okay? Even though the sets could be exponential and are implicitly defined, sometimes you can implement the greedy step in polynomial time and then the algorithm will run in polynomial time even though the sets are not explicitly given to you, okay? So, so that's one reason why the algorithm also is, uh, okay, we'll stop there. There's something called max k cover, which is very nice. Uh, it's very closely related to set cover. So, you can, uh, you can. Uh Next lecture is a, a last uh, lecture in terms of content. And, and we'll do some TSP approximation and on uh, next Wednesday is basically review and I'm not going to do any content. Uh, we'll release a homework 11 mainly for you to practice a little bit. Even it's not due. Uh, it's uh, an approximation. And uh, 
So I'm going to do a, the course evaluations next lecture. So see if you can come and uh, even those who normally sit at home and watch the videos, I'll try to see if they can come, okay? <laughs> All right? Okay, thank you.